Hi, thanks for joining us for the message from Palmyra Grace this week. We're praying that you'll be encouraged to live out the truths you hear from God's Word in your families and communities. You guys doing good? All right, we're going to be in Acts chapter 27 today as we continue with uh, the series that I uh, felt like the Lord wanted me to start with as I started my ministry here at Palmyra Grace Church. And that is, uh, the series is called Missio Dei, uh, which is a Latin theological term that uh, it's translated the mission of God. And really, uh, what it's talking about is the church's uh, job, really, to partner with God on His mission. Uh, so we started this last week talking uh, about what God had for us to do. I know this church has spent a great deal of time talking about its individual mission and what God has for this church to be doing. Uh, so we're, some of this is uh, going over it again, but it's also good to be reminded of the things that God wants to do. And so we are on a mission from the Lord. Part of being on God's mission, though, here's the bummer, you ready? Part of being on God's mission is that it often involves <laughs> collisions. Can I say it that way? <laughs> there are tough times coming. Jesus said it this way. In this world, you will have many trials and troubles or tribulations or however you want to read that. It's going to be a bummer for you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, that's good news. But he doesn't end it there. He says, take courage, for I have overcome the world, right? Woo! But, for you and I to be a part of this mission, I think it's important for us to understand that hard times can come. Now, I'm calling this today Brace for Impact. And uh, you'll notice the graphic up there is one of those crash test dummies. Any of you from the 80s and remember those commercials with the crash test dummies? Remember those? They were the best, right? And uh, listen, we call these guys dummies. Crash test dummies. And I think that is a horrible name for them. You know why? Because I think that they should be called crash test heroes. And here's why. They're heroes. Because their whole reason for being, <laughs> their purpose, is to be placed in situations uh, where destruction is imminent, where there's a crash coming, and they only are placed there for one purpose, and that is to keep us alive, to keep us safe. Does that make sense? Now, this goes against our thinking, because here's why. We, we like to, well, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say we. Let me say me. I like to avoid pain. Anybody else? Right? This is why I don't go to the gym very much. I want to avoid pain. I don't like pain. I do everything that I can do to sort of circumvent pain in my life. When I see pain coming, dude, I'm going the other direction. You guys with me? Anybody else like that? All right. But I wonder if maybe by having that attitude and by always wanting to kind of get around the times of pain and crisis in our life, if we're actually missing the bullseye of what God desires for you and I to be in so that we can make the biggest impact that we possibly can make for him. Sometimes, here's what I'm saying, sometimes God allows the pain in our life. And when we're always trying to get around the pain, okay, that's hurtful, I don't like this, so I'm going to get a divorce, or I'm going to leave the church, or I, I don't like, listen, God's saying, no, 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 actually what I'm concerned about here is you, not just the destination of where you're going, but the journey and how you get there. You're going to hear me say this a lot, but I'm going to say it right now for the very first time in this church. Please hear me. It is not all about getting your ticket and going to heaven. It's just not. God is concerned with your character and my character. My dad was a preacher for a number of years. And he would often say things that would freak people out. I don't know where I got it. But my dad had a big old pulpit, one of the churches he preached in, and he said this. He said, you know what? He said, every pastor should have a 44 Magnum in the pulpit. And when anybody comes up and accepts Jesus in their life, that pastor should pull it out and blow them home to glory right then. 
Praise the Lord, right? Amen. Now that's crazy. Obviously we don't do that. Why? Because God, you see, this is what's interesting to me. You don't accept the Lord and then all of a sudden, boom, you're in heaven. Or this church would be empty, right? God leaves us here. And I'm not totally for sure exactly why he leaves us here for that season, but he leaves us here to accomplish something big, I think, for him. Now, leaving us here is going to include times of collision and times of pain. I think it's really important that the church brace themselves for those collisions that are coming, that we're ready for them. We have seen time and time again over the last 50 years, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you know that this is true, but we have seen Christian leaders in the church fall by the wayside again and again and again. The media likes to make a big deal about it. We've seen it this year. Okay, people who at one time taught God's word or led worship or whatever, and then you find that they fall to sin. What happened? Many times the spiritual attack, the crisis that just life brings, shakes them so much, they're not braced, they're not ready for what's coming. And I want to tell you right here from the very beginning, this isn't an end time sermon, but I'm going to tell you, Gang, Jesus is coming back very, very soon. And there could be very hard times coming our way. As a matter of fact, we live in a day where wars and rumors of war, where earthquakes in various places, just in the last month we've seen, children disobeying their parents, people calling good things evil and calling evil good these are all signs of the times. I believe an impact is coming, collisions coming, and the church made up of individuals in this room and those listening online. Let me tell you, every man, every woman, every teenager, every child, we need to be braced for what's coming. Now, we started last week talking about the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 26, and Paul was in a legal trial there. He's standing before the governor of, of uh, a guy named Festus and Agrippa II, and he's giving his testimony, but he appealed to Caesar. He wanted to go to Rome. And you need to understand, Paul always wanted to go to Rome. He always wanted to go to Rome. Why? Why did Paul want to go to Rome? Because Rome was like a hub city, culturally and economically and for trade and things like that. It was a huge place where a lot of people traveled through. So Paul thought to himself, if I could just get to Rome, bro, if I could get there, then <laughs> I could speak this message of Jesus Christ and I would have the largest impact. So he always wanted to get to Rome, but it's really interesting because God kept sidetracking him in these different little places. And he never could get there. So now, in our text, he's finally going to Rome. It's awesome. He gets an all-expenses-paid cruise to Rome. Whoa! As a prisoner. Okay? So we find out he's on a boat here with 276 other souls. Made up of three types of people. Prisoners like him. Uh, soldiers that are watching the prisoners, and then the third type are the sailors, okay? So sailors, soldiers, and prisoners are all on this boat, and they set out, and it's groovy, man. Everything's wonderful and great. But Paul gets this feeling. He's like, hey, 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 this trip is going to involve some problems, and I don't feel good about it. Like, maybe we should chill out here for a little bit. But nobody listens to Paul. Because he's a prisoner. They're probably thinking, uh, you know, Paul, you just don't want to go to Rome because you're going to die in Rome probably is what's going to happen. So we understand you wanting to slow things down a little bit. Look at the weather. It's perfect. We ain't listening to you. Makes sense to me. So they're on this boat. Everything's groovy. And here's where we pick up. You with me? Yes. Thank you, Nate. Acts chapter 27, starting in verse 13. I better use the slides here. Here we go. When a gentle south wind sprang up, they thought that they had achieved their purpose. They weighed anchor and they sailed along the shore of Crete. But before long, a fierce wind called the Northeaster rushed down from the island. Since the ship was caught and unable to head into the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. And after running under the shelter of a little island called Cauda, we were barely able to get control of the skiff. After hoisting it up, they used ropes and tackle and they girded the ship. Fearing they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the drift anchor. And in this way, they were driven along. Okay, there's a lot of sailor language here. Don't get lost in all of that. 
what's he basically saying? Everything was nice and groovy. Weather was beautiful, calm sky, little nice little breeze, sunny, everything's wonderful. And then all of a sudden, it was on. The storm came. And we're going to read, this storm was no little storm. It's a big storm. It lasts for two weeks. Total darkness. It's on. The, the ship is going to, I'm going to ruin the story for you. Here's the end of the story. You ready? The ship breaks apart. It runs, it has an impact. And it runs into a shoreline and completely busts apart. That's the end of the story. So this is hard times. I was thinking about that. You know, uh, sometimes our Christian life is like that. We can become a Christian, we can start off this thing, and, and it can seem like it's all good skies, man, everything's groovy. Everything looks great. Maybe someone told us, if you come to Jesus, man, it's going to make everything in your life awesome. And then we're like surprised once we come to the Lord that there's actually hard times involved. Not just in my life personally, but sometimes in my marriage with my kid. My kids are freaking out on me. Nobody probably relates to that here. Our church, there's crisis happening in the church. There's crisis happening in our nation. There's crisis happening in the world. Like I thought that when I got on the good ship salvation, that I thought everything was going to be, here's the theological term, hunky-dory. I thought it was going to be hunky-dory, but it ain't. What's going on? And I'm reminded again, gang, that God, God is more concerned... I believe, with our journey and how we get there than he is even with the destination. You with me? Yes, I can't wait to get to heaven. It's going to be the coolest thing ever. I don't think any mind has ever fathomed how great it's going to be. No eye has seen, no ear has heard. It's going to be incredible. I cannot wait for heaven. But I'm telling you, God left us here for a reason and he cares about our character. You guys with me? So what's happening here is a lot of sailor jargon, but basically it's getting tough uh, for these guys. Let's keep going here. Verse 18. Because we were being severely battered by the storm. And listen, I know it's easy to read stories like this and just be like, okay, yeah, they were severely battered, like big whoop -dee -dee. They were severely battered. Have you ever been on a boat that is like going down? No, you probably haven't. I would imagine, I mean, I used to watch Gilligan's Island and I saw the first pilot episode. The weather starts getting rough. The tiny ship is tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You got to put some flesh and blood on this story, man. This is crazy. He says, because we were being severely battered by the storm, they began to jettison the cargo. I love that. They're not just dropping cargo over the side. The word jettison is used. Like, that's a cool word. I don't know what it means. I think it means they chucked it really far. They jettisoned the cargo the next day. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. And for many days, neither sun nor stars appeared. And the severe storm kept raging. And finally, all hope was fading that we would be saved. You ever feel like that? Like you're in a situation where it's just like, I like it. Finally, they were feeling that all hope was lost. Like maybe you wouldn't word it that exact way, but you're kind of like, man, in my marriage, I kind of don't know if it's going to make it, man. Or with this one kid of mine who's just driving me batty, I, <laughs> I don't know. All hope's lost. This is habit. It's totally dark. You can't see the stars. You can't see the sun at daytime. You can't see the moon at nighttime. We're going to fight 14 days this is happening. This isn't just a little teeny thing. This is intense storm. Now, I see Paul do five things to brace himself for the impact that's going to come. I told you, they're going to run into an island. It's going to happen. How does he brace himself? Here's number one that I think relates to you and I. First thing we see him do is bail. They're getting rid of anything and everything that might weigh them down. I don't know if you've ever been on a boat. Kelly and I one time went to the Bahamas. She found a thing for like $300 for a three-day trip to Bahamas. We spent five times that flying to Miami. Then I had to carry my suitcase all the way across Miami. And uh, we get on the boat. We have to wait and get on the boat. The whole thing went to way too fast. And I thought, I hate cruises. Why do people do this to themselves? 
I'll tell you why, because you eat like a champion. <laughs> it is awesome. It's like their whole strategy is just to fatten you up. But let me tell you something that doesn't happen on a cruise. Princess crew, Disney cruise, whatever. Let me tell you what it doesn't happen. You never probably saw people just chucking stuff overboard. Jettisoning. <laughs> I like that. You never saw that, right? Why? Why didn't you? Well, because it's cruise time, man. Everything's beautiful. But let me tell you, if the weather did start getting rough and the tiny ship was tossed, they would. If you were out there, man, they'd be chucking anything and everything that would weigh that boat down. And that's what they did here in the story. I believe this is a principle for you and I as well. Is there anything in your life today that is weighing you down? Something hidden in your heart that maybe nobody else knows about. Maybe not even your spouse or your employer, definitely not your church folk. Is there anything there that maybe it's greed, maybe it's anger, can't handle the, the road rage, or the guys that are cutting you off? Maybe it's jealousy, maybe it's lust. Something that could, we, listen, when I said earlier that we've seen Christian leaders fall by the wayside by massive numbers, What's happening there? I didn't say this in the first service. I'm going to say it now. There was a teacher I greatly respected who died a couple years ago named Ravi Zacharias. Incredible Bible teacher. Incredible. And so he had his funeral and thousands of people came to the funeral and his wife and everybody. And as the funeral was happening, they televised it and there was a young lady at home watching the funeral at home. And then she had been abused by this man. Sexually. And so she came forward after the funeral. It was completely shocking. This guy has an intense, awesome radio ministry. He had it for years. It would have continued after he died. As a matter of fact, not only would the word have continued to go out, but it would have to continued to fund his wife and his children and probably his grandchildren would have paid for everything. But when this young lady came out and exposed what had happened, his wife, Ravi's wife, I, I had the utmost respect for her. Because she said, you know what? I'm so sorry. I believe you. I did not know this happened, but I believe you. And we will never play my husband's sermons again. I didn't know he was living this double life. I have a lot of respect for that because that's her income for the rest of her life. Be all that as it may. Let me just say, your sin will take you out. It'll take out any future ministry, even after you die. The hidden things in your life. What might be weighing you and I down today, keeping us from future ministry? Whatever it is, you know what it is. Throw it overboard. Don't just go, well, I guess I'll... No, man, jettison that bad boy. You with me? Just trying to keep the kids in. You know, I had a brother-in-law, I still have a brother-in-law named Doug. Doug is a huge college football fan, huge. And um, Doug uh, loves the Colorado Buffaloes. And uh, since he was a little kid, has all the shirts and everything like that. He's in his 60s now. But just a huge, huge Colorado Buff fan. And I remember one year, he told me, he said, Michael, uh, I am, uh, I'm feeling that the Lord wants me to drop being a fan of the Colorado Buffaloes for one year. And I was like, why? And he's like, because I love them too much. And it's affecting my relationship with Jesus. So I was like, man, that's awesome. Good for you. So he didn't, he didn't listen to any radio. He, he would always listen to sports radio, the Colorado Buffs in that area of Denver. But he didn't listen to anything. That was the year they went to the national championship with Cordell Stewart, who you guys might know because he went to, Cordell went to uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But that was the year he was a champion. Doug didn't listen to one second of any podcast. And his dad, who's not a Christian, his brother, who's not a Christian, they all had season tickets together. They thought Doug was nuts. What are you doing? But he was saying, I got to do this for Jesus, man. I got to do it for Jesus. He missed the whole thing. I had huge respect for that guy. Let me tell you, being a fan of a team is not a sin. It's not a sin unless God tells you not to do it. Are we willing to get rid of anything and everything that might weigh us down to keep us from having the impact that God wants us to have for him and for his glory. That's what's happening here. Let's keep going. Verse 21. Here we go. 
Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and he said, you men should have followed my... I love this. Paul, Paul's like, uh, I told you so. You guys ever do that? I know you don't. <laughs> like, I told you. If you guys had just listened to me, you stinking weirdos. That's my translation. Here he goes. <laughs> he says, you guys should have followed my advice not to sail from Crete and sustain this damage and loss. <laughs> Now I urge you to take courage, because there will be no loss of any of your lives, but only of the ship. For last night, now imagine if you're a non-Christian soldier on this boat, and this prisoner is telling you this after you've been getting beat up for three days. Listen to this. Last night, an angel of the God I belong to and serve stood by me, and he said, don't be afraid, Paul. It's necessary for you to appear before Caesar. And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. So take courage, man, because I believe God that it will be just the way it was told me. But we got to run around on some island. I like that. God, the God that I serve. God, I mean, Paul here is standing before these sailors, soldiers, and prisoners. And he's standing before, they're all scared to death. They've been throwing stuff overboard. And he's freaking out. But not Paul. Paul stands up there. And he, he stands and he connects himself with God. And he does the second thing that I think we should be doing to brace ourselves. And that is, he refocuses on the primary objective. Or I could say it this way. He refocuses on the mission that God has for his life. He says this, the God I, I serve, he told me that I'm supposed to go to Rome. Like I have to appear before Caesar. I've always wanted to, but God told me last night. He affirmed it. My mission, my Messio day. My mission from God is that I'm going to go to Rome. And so God says you're going to make it. Because nothing, listen, nothing Paul's going to happen to you until you accomplish my will for your life. As long as you're submitted to me and to my will, it will be accomplished. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans, God says. I know the plans I have for you. God has plans. You know how you get rid of fear in your life? really simple. If you're afraid of stuff, here's how you get rid of fear. Just refocus on your primary objective. What am I here for? Why did God leave me on the planet? What am I doing? If I'm, if, listen, if you're married today, if you're married, you're listening to me. Let me tell you something. You have a mission for your marriage. I believe this. If you're an old, if you've been married for more than 20 years, 25 years, you, part of your mission is to help these younger people that are getting married that don't know what they're doing. Like Sean and Gina. You guys don't know what you're doing. <laughs> How long have you been married? What, nine months? Oh, yeah, you're experts. <laughs> they need help, man. You know, the Bible talks about the older coming alongside the younger. Older men coming alongside younger men. Older women coming alongside younger women. Love you guys. Just playing. I know you're perfect. <laughs> you have a mission. God's left you here for a reason. It's not just to say, so what do we do? In times of crisis, you refocus. You say, okay, God, why am I here? What am I still doing here? What do you want to use me as? How can I serve whatever? You guys with me? This is huge. Oftentimes, what happens in many churches is when change is happening or there's crisis coming or whatever, people back off. Well, we pay certain people to do all that. So we'll pay you to take care of that weird stuff. No, man. God's got a purpose for your life and my life, all of us together. We got to refocus on that at times. Paul stands up in front of these people and says, let me tell you, I know you're freaking out. I get it. I, you're freaking like a deacon. That rhymed. But I want to encourage you. God told me that I have to go. I'm going to fulfill the mission he has for my life. And, good news, he's going to He's going to save all you guys as well. Pretty cool. All right, let's keep going. Now, uh, let's see, where are we at? Somebody help me. There we go. Verse 27. Here we go. When the 14th night came, 14 nights, you guys. Last I checked, that's two weeks. This isn't a little storm that blew by. 14 stinking nights. Hello. 
That's crazy. When the 14th night came, we were drifting in the Adriatic Sea, and about midnight, the sailors thought they were approaching land. They took soundings and found it to be 120 feet deep. When they had sailed a little farther and sounded again, they found it to be 90 feet deep. And then, fearing that we might run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern, and they prayed for daylight. You ever, you ever be in, been in such a crisis in your life or your marriage or your work or whatever that it's just such a storm, you're just praying for daylight? You're like, God, please help me. Just me? Okay, all right. Well, that, these guys, they're praying for daylight. Like, God, please, for the love of yourself, help me out of this bind. Here we go. Verse 30. Some sailors tried to escape from the ship. They had let down the skiff, that's like a life raft, into the sea, pretending that they were going to put out anchors from the bow. <laughs> Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. And then the soldiers cut the ropes holding the life raft and they let it drift or drop, uh, drop away. Check this out. It's hitting two weeks, dark, rain, storms, wave, buffeting the ship, man. And they've got the anchors set and everything and things are going crazy. And some of the sailors who they get this, they were like, this is longer than we've ever, we didn't get this in training. They didn't go over this in boot camp. This is intense. And so some of them are just like, hey, we're going uh, to go check the anchors. <laughs> we'll be right back. And then they get in. Their, their total plan is to take that boat and get out of there. They want out. And Paul totally catches them. I love it. Paul's like, hey, and he tells the main soldier, the, the centurion, he's like, hey, these guys are trying to escape. But I just want to tell you, if they leave, not only will they be dust and die, all of us are, are dying. They cannot leave the boat. So they literally cut the boat, the life raft away, and they let it go. This is the third thing that I want to bring up today, and that is this. To brace ourselves, we must be those that attach ourselves. We attach ourselves to other people. Why? We attach ourselves for the success of the whole. Are you with me? In times of crisis, let me just clue you in. We need you. You need us. You need me. You need the people sitting in front of you. You need the people sitting behind you and next to you. We need each other. It's time to attach ourselves to each other. It's not time to say, well, I don't really like how this boat's sailing. I think I'll just go jump on another boat. No, we need you. We need you to stick it out with us. We need to attach ourselves with you. This is why at this particular church, we emphasize the grace group so much. We want people in fellowship, in a relationship with each other. Because when I'm going through something really, really hard, I need people praying for me. I need help. Does that make sense? It's huge. We attach ourselves to others for the sake of the whole, for the success of the whole. Guys, in times of crisis, it's all hands on deck. All hands on deck. Man, when they're throwing stuff overboard, it's not just the sailors who were doing that. They're getting the guys down in the galley part of the boat, you know, the prisoners. They're like, grab something, chuck it over. They're getting the soldiers. It's all hands on deck. Everybody's attaching themselves together to work for the success of the whole. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 10. Don't stop meeting together. Like it's really important. Whoever wrote Hebrews by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says this, don't stop meeting together. Don't neglect it, man. Now listen, some people are in the habit of doing that. Some people are like, yeah, it's just me and God and I'm good with that. I don't need the church. I don't need people. And I just like, I'm working on me right now. I'm working on me right now. Here's the problem with you working on you right now. You look like a lifelong project to me. So am I. If we all wait until we have our stuff together, nothing's ever going to get done. If we all have an attitude that we just pay a couple people to do all the work of the church, nothing's going to get done. We need each other. The body of Christ needs you. You guys with me? Am I drill, drilling this in enough? We got to attach ourselves. The, the, the writer here is saying, listen, it's the habit of some people and, and you know, they, they're, they don't want to meet together anymore. Don't let that be you. And then he says this, and he goes, and all the more, 
As you're seeing the day approaching, as you're seeing the signs of the times and wars and earthquakes and people calling good evil and evil good, and we're seeing all this stuff in our culture and people walking away in mass from Christianity and from a relationship with God, as you're seeing that, don't you know we need you more than ever? Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo! We need you. Well, I don't know, man. I'm pretty jacked up. I don't know, I don't know if you... Uh, you don't know what's going on. Listen, I understand that we all are not perfect. But gang, attach yourselves to other people. I promise you, I promise you this. In this church anyway, and I don't even know everybody here very well. But I'm going to tell you this. The people sitting next to you are not perfect. But they love you. They don't even know you. They love you. We did the greeting thing the last two weeks. I asked them if we could bring that. Start greeting each other. And isn't that a weird time? It's kind of weird for some people. Like, oh, uh, hello, hi, yeah. I'm just really, yeah, nice. God bless. It's weird. It is. But it's good. Because it breaks down that, that wall that I think many of us can have. I need you guys. We need this church. Amen? Okay. Let's keep going. All right. Acts 27, verse 33. When it was about daylight, Paul urged them all to take food, saying, Today's the 14th day that you've been waiting and going without food, having eaten nothing. So I urge you to take some food, for this is for your survival, since none of you will lose a hair on your head. After he said these things, he had taken some bread, he gave thanks to God in the presence of all of them, and after he broke it, he began to eat. They all were encouraged, and they took food themselves. In all, there were 276 of us on the ship. Paul here, in the midst of all of this, takes bread, breaks it, gives thanks. What does that sound like to anybody? Ah. And it, I love it. it says, he did it in the presence of everybody. He did it in front of his fellow prisoners. He did it in front of the soldiers. He did it in front of the sailors. He didn't care what anybody thought about him. He just stands up and says, listen guys, you're all acting like you're hypoglycemic. <laughs> Like, you're a little edgy. How about you eat something? Get a Snickers. <laughs> Anybody deal with hypoglycemia? About 4 o'clock in the afternoon, if I haven't eaten, like, you don't want to be around me. I get to be a bear. Ah! Imagine 14. No wonder those sailors wanted to get off the boat. Like, we don't care about the storm. These people are nuts. Paul says, I want you to eat something, man. Come on, be encouraged here. Look at the, the language that's used uh, here. Oh, by the way, this is what it is. He's being a catalyst of hope. He's serving as a catalyst of hope. He's saying, in the midst of this storm, guys, not a hair on your head's going to be hurt. I've got to appear in Rome. This is all going to happen. I want to bring hope. Do you understand? It says there that it was about daylight. You and I are the embodiment of that line. It is about daylight. We are the hope that God has sent into this world. Jesus said it like this, right? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. Last week, I told you, I put up the scripture that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Amen? But now Jesus says, oh, by the way, you are the light. Whoa, 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 who's the light here? Well, I don't understand. When you have Jesus, the light of the world, inside of you, now you get to be the light of the world needs so much. Remember last week, talking about lighting a match and, and just evading the darkness around us? It is you and I. We can be a catalyst of hope to this world. What I was going to show you there is, look at the language here in verse 20. Many days, it's dark, you can't see the stars, it's, it's no one thought... It, they were going to be saved. And then verse 33, it was about daylight. And it says he urged them, that word parakaleo is in Greek. And it just basically has a lot of different meanings. But one of them is encourage. He's, in, he's urging them. He's encouraging them. Guys, we've got this. Don't give up. It's been 14 days though. You don't understand, pastor man, what I've gone through. My wife and I, we lost our baby. We had a miscarriage. We've had two miscarriages. Like, this isn't just a little storm here. This is a raging storm that is ripping up our boat. Like, I'm just being real with you. This is hard. Like, what are we supposed to do? What do you say to your coworker who tells you, I don't want to go to church because God let my mom die? 
What do you say to somebody like that? I mean, I love my mom. What's going on? We are called, even in times like that, to speak life to people. Be a catalyst of hope. Let me tell you what the church doesn't need. Please hear this. We don't need more people pointing out the problems. We got it. Thank you. I don't need you pointing the finger at somebody else telling me what's wrong with their life. Anybody say amen? We don't need somebody else pointing out the problems in our church or somebody else pointing out the problems in our government. Some people think it's their special ministry from God to just complain and point out the problems. Now, granted, some people don't even know there is a problem and there are some problems, but we got to go way beyond just always being the person that points out the problems. Well, I don't like this and this is what you're doing wrong and this is what they're doing wrong. We don't need any more of that. You know what we need? We need catalysts of hope. We need people who will speak life into that. And let me just tell you, gang, if you're hearing somebody who all they can do is complain, shut it down. You have the ability to do that. Say, well, time out, time out. Sorry, man. I love Jesus and I love you, but I can't listen to this anymore. What? That got really intense really quick. The kids are in service today, Pastor Michael. Gang, you and I are called to bring hope to a world that desperately needs it. May we be that. Amen? All right, let's keep going. Verse 39. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but sighted a bay with a beach. They planned to run the ship ashore if they could. And after cutting loose the anchors, before they had dropped the anchors, now they're cutting them loose. Okay? They left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that held the rudders. There's ropes that go to the rudders that hold on to the big steering wheel. So basically they're saying, we can't steer anymore. Cut those things. Loosen them up. Okay? The, the rudder. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and headed for the beach. So they put up the sail. They cut the ropes that they could steer with. They cut off the anchors and they put up the sail to let the wind take them. Um, they headed for the beach. Verse 41, but they struck a sandbar and they ran the ship aground. The bow jammed fast and remained immovable while the stern began to break up by the pounding of the waves. What's happening? The boat is going to shreds here. It has hit and what have they done? They have literally thrown up the sails. They've cut everything and they're like, all right, let's just see what happens here. The equivalent for you and I, gang, is we throw up the sail and say, okay, Lord, we cannot control this anymore. You're in charge. And this is the last and final thing that we can do, gang, and that is this. We can eliminate retreat as an option. We can't steer ourselves out of here. We can't do anything that we think could save us. We're just going to throw up the sails. God, you're in charge. You take us where you want us to go. We're there. You know what? I think, I believe, and I said, I said it last week, I'll say it again. I believe that there is a very real enemy of God who hates my guts. And he hates your guts. You know why? Because he hates Jesus' guts. And you and I have Jesus in us. So he hates our guts. He hates us. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. He wants to take us out. You know what he's always doing? He's whispering. The Bible says one of his names is the accuser of the brethren. You ever felt like you've got somebody just accusing you? Michael, you're so lame. Michael, you're so dumb. Oh, you could never do that. Look at you. Look at your life. Come on. How could you ever be a pastor? How could you stand up and preach to other people? Come on. You ever hear stuff like that? Maybe your name, not Michael. The accuser of the brethren. He wants you. Why? You know what? It was easier, dude, before you gave your life to Jesus, before you started going after the Lord, it was easier. Why don't you just go back to the old life? Can I tell you? Lots and lots of people are doing this today. They're just going, yeah, tried it, can't do it, too hard. Didn't help my marriage, didn't help my kid. I'm, it's just way too hard. Gang, I'm telling you, we need to eliminate retreat as an option. In the year 1519, there was a guy named Cortez. I'll bring you back to school for just a minute. Cortez left Spain, and he brought this, this uh, a bunch of ships, we'll call it. What do they call that? Uh, armada, thank you, armada. I almost said a pinata. He brought a pinata. 
an armada of ships. He brings them from Spain. They land on the eastern coast of Mexico. And they get there and they get off the ships and they're on land and, and all the stuff happens, right? Famine and it's really, really hard. And they begin to whisper and complain with each other. You know what? We had it better in the old land. Like, like, we should just go back to the old land. Forget Cortez. Forget the mission that God called him to. Let's get back on the boat and let's go. And when Cortez started hearing all these little whisperings, you know what he did? He went in night, at nighttime and he set fire to all the ships and burned the ships on the shore. Oh, ho, ho. So everybody comes out of their, their little huts or whatever and they're like, what? All the boats. And he's like, yeah, we ain't going back. We're here. God's called us for such a time as this. We're eliminating retreat as an option. Gang, those of us that have followed Jesus Christ, can I just tell you, it's not always hunky-dory. It can be hard. It can be hard. But eliminate that idea. Well, you just don't understand what I'm going through, and you don't understand my life, Pastor Michael, and, 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 and what I've had to deal with. I, you're right, I don't. I'm not you. But I promise you, I've gone through some stuff too. This goes back to attaching ourselves to each other. We need each other. Let's talk. Let's pray together. But we can do this. Don't go back. Amen? Gang, when the, when the hard stuff starts coming in our nation and everything like that, we better be braced, man. We better be ready. You better know. Paul said this, I know in whom I have believed. Like, I know. Like, you ain't convincing me differently. Well, you know, I heard about this in children's church, but then I went to school and my teacher told me or my professor told me that, you know, God's not really real and that was just my parents. Dude, you better be braced, man. You better know that all hell is coming against this next generation. We got to pray for them and they got to be ready. Eliminate retreat as an option. Let's finish the chapter. Here we go. Verse 42 through 44, the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners so that no one could swim away and escape. But listen to this, the centurion kept them from carrying out their plan because he wanted to save Paul. That means that Paul had such an impact on that centurion that he literally saved all these guys' lives. It's amazing to me. God cares about how we do this journey. That's what that says to me. Okay, he kept on, uh, he wanted to say Paul. And so he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. Now the rest were to follow some on planks and some on debris from the ship. And in this way, look at this, everyone safely reached the shore. <laughs> Everybody makes it. So the story, they want to kill, Paul's like, I mean, the centurion's like, no, I love Paul, we're not going to do this. Uh, and so don't kill anybody. If you can swim, Jump overboard. We're close enough now. I know the waves are crazy, but get there. Swim. And there's a bunch of guys going, uh, we, don't, we, we don't know how to swim. No one never took lessons at the why. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. But the, as, as they're doing that, the ship is being busted apart, the waves, and it's literally breaking. The bow's falling off the front and all the, it's going crazy. And so what happens, it tells us specifically that these guys that don't know how to swim jump overboard and they grab debris. They grab pieces of board of ship and they ride into the shore. This is the first account of surfing in the Bible. They're riding their boards. Okay, that joke goes better in Southern California, but Here's my point and the last thing I'm going to say today. Gang, they grabbed onto the wreckage and they rode it to salvation. If I can say it that way, they were saved. I believe that this speaks to you and I too. Absolutely, God will use your education, your experience, your wisdom. He wants to use that for the glory of the kingdom of God for Jesus. He will use that. But can I also encourage you today with this? He will not only use your successes in life for his glory. He will also use the wreckage of your life. He will use the times when you and I have blown it. One of my very good friends spent seven years in prison for doing some really bad things. And God, I've seen God use Chauncey in a way that just blows me away. As he's gotten out and he's ministered to not only other inmates, but street gangs and things like that. Where they look at him and they see him and, and the kind of person that he is and he's radical for Jesus. And God has used the wreckage of his life that other people could grab onto that and be saved themselves. 
You say, you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand where I've been. I'm a, uh, you know, I had a baby out of wedlock or, or whatever it is, fill in the blank. It does not matter where you've been or what you've done. God can use even the weak things in your life to blow the minds of those who think they're smart. God wants to use us. Don't wait on the sidelines. Well, I just, uh, no, man. Messio Day, the mission of God is that every person, even if you're a teenager here, well, I just don't know that much and I'm not really, you know, I'm not one of the cool kids at school. It doesn't matter. God will help you relate to somebody if you'll be open to him. Let him have access to the debris, the garbage in your life. Again, if we all just waited until we were all ready and perfect, nothing would ever get done. Did you hear that young girl today on the video? 16 schools in our local area don't have a Bible school. We can pray about that for sure. But we need another generation of young people to rise up and say, I'll start a Bible club at my school. I'll do that. Yeah, why not? Let's go for it. No, well, you're not really a very good speaker, and I don't know if anybody... Who cares? God will use a wreck like you and me. Amen? Thanks again for joining us this week. We hope it will help you as you live out your life with God, together, and on mission. We'd love to connect with you. Feel free to reach out through our social media pages, website, or in person on Sunday mornings at 9 or 1045 a.m.